Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Vietnam on the Mic. Thank you so much for tuning this episode. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Mr. Tony Bui, who is an award-winning Vietnamese-American film producer, writer, and director. He was born in Saigon, raised in California, and soon to be located in New York City for an artist residency at Columbia University. So, so today, I'm super excited to be interviewing Tony because, firstly, I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to have lunch with him and to listen to his journey as a film director and hear about his experiences as an Asian-American in America as well. And I thought that his story was incredibly inspiring and something that I want to share with all of you on this podcast. So today on this episode, we'll be hearing about his life story and career in film, aspirations for Asian Americans in the industry, and to hear some advice he has for young Vietnamese Americans and for Vietnamese as well in this generation. So to give you guys all some background information about Tony's amazing career, Tony's work includes Three Seasons, which was a film created in 1999 that focuses on Vietnam's urban cultural changes in the early stages of the post-Vietnamese war economic reforms. The film was written, produced, and directed by Tony, and it was actually, I find this super interesting, the first American film to be made in Vietnam after Bill Clinton lifted the embargoes on Vietnam, so super influential film. Tony has made many other widely accredited films, such as Green Dragon, featuring Patrick Swayze, and is currently working on an upcoming film telling the story of Napalm Girl from the super famous Vietnam War photograph that, you know, has a girl running down. So um, we'll hear more about that later, but thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today, Tony. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So first question, how did you get into the film industry? So you've obviously been super experienced. You've done a lot. How did you first enter um, the industry and get inspired? Um, there's so it's, uh, you know, when I was when I was doing it, there was very little. Uh, I mean, there's really no one else doing it in terms of any music people I can look up to. So it really it's almost by accident. I was actually I grew up in Silicon Valley. Uh, my parents worked in, you know, uh, in the tech industry, um, software, computers and all that. And my dad. Uh, I was working for a company, got laid off that year, and he decided to open up a video store. It was back before streamings, back when, like, you know, people would go and rent their movies from, like, Blockbuster and stuff like that, way before your time and probably your listeners, but your parents definitely will know. <laughs> and if you wanted to see a movie, you didn't just press a go online, press a button. You actually had to go to a physical, you know, brick and mortar and, like, really rent the, you know, either the video or the DVD. So anyway, so that's what um, my parents ended up doing that. It became successful, had, I think, uh, at one point, like five video stores or something like that. And um, and being, you know, like a freshman in high school, sophomore in high school, I ended up just, you know, uh, having literally tens of thousands of movies that I can watch at any time. So it was just a, you know, it's one of those weird kind of things that happened. I was not on that trajectory at all. But I started watching mm -hmm. a lot of movies and it just changed my life. And then, and um, I, uh, you know, in, in that area, where I grew up, no, there was really no one I can point to that and say, oh, I want to, you know, I want to be a filmmaker or someone I can sort of mentor me or someone I can sort of see it, use as a, a model. So it was a, it was a tough time, but it was, um, it was something that I just knew I wanted to do and I went and, went and pursued it. That's amazing. So you said there's like no really Asian directors or Asian actors at that time that you could really look up to. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, now thankfully, you know, we're in this era of Asian representation and we have a lot more films with, you know, Asian directors and Asian actors, and we're in the last few years. There's an explosion of Asian stories, you know, with, you know, and really the beginning that really, I mean, there've been four films before that, of course, but really that kicked it off into the mainstream. You know, obviously it was Crazy Rich Asians, you know, led to a lot of other films. Now we have, um, you know, um, uh, um, Everything Everywhere All at Once it was nominated for like, you know, you know, multiple Oscars. So you know, it's just a really, really amazing time. But back then there was none. Um, when I Finally decided I wanted to go to film school. Everyone was against it, including my parents. They were extremely upset by it. I think my mom actually cried. And um, <laughs> uh, but it was something I knew I wanted to do. And um, and when I went to film school, you know, out of a freshman class of something like you know over two hundred people, I think that there was a total of maybe ten Asians and only one Vietnamese, and that was me. You know, so you know it was it was definitely um, not a lot of us out there at the time. Um, and so there was really no one I can say, I can look to, call to, it, it was really just all the movies I watched and, and those were sort of my, my you know, the guide and the passion of the films that I watched were sort of, you know, I was following that, you know, in terms of, but I had no idea what, I, what, how, you know, how to go about it. What, you know, where I grew up wasn't like you go, oh, I'm going to be a film director. It was actually sort of, uh, 
you know, a, a journey of, um, of, of uh, a lot of discovery, a lot of stumbling along the way and figuring, figuring it out. So, um, but, um, yeah, but I'm glad I did and stuck with it. That's awesome. So you went to film school, you discovered your passion through your dad's store and realized you wanted to be a film director or be in that industry. Can you tell us like about the first film that you directed perhaps, or kind of like development process that you went through when you first started your career? Yeah, to be honest, you know, when I, when I first did it, because, you know, my parents had the video stores, I was watching a lot of mainstream films. So when I began, you know, I wanted to make, you know, the classic American films and just, you know, I was, you know, and, um, you know, I didn't have this drive to make the kind of stories, you know, whether Asian stories, the Vietnamese stories, you know, that I would eventually be making. It wasn't until I actually went to Vietnam for the first time in 1993. And um, um, even though I was born in Saigon, I left when I was only two years old. So I had really no uh, memory or, or, or any idea of what Vietnam and so I grew up in Northern California, and and um, at that point, maybe I'd never even been out of the country. I think I went to Mexico on a family trip, like briefly, but I went to Vietnam, blew my mind, and um, and you know, I, st I still remember distinctly walking into a bookstore and seeing something I'd never seen before growing up in America, and that is, all the faces on in the books and on the magazine rack were all faces of people who looked like me or, or my parents. You know, they're all Vietnamese faces. And it was such a jarring thing because growing up in America, I just got used to the fact it actually didn't bother me because there's something that, you know, since, since, you know, I was a baby, I was just used to walking in and, and, and everyone, you know, was either white and then a few, maybe African-American or Latino, but it's pretty much, you know, that was the dominant color and face I would see all the time. And again, it wasn't like it weighed on me, you know, and um, it's just because, you know, it was the way, you know, the way things were. But also, I didn't know that something was missing. I didn't know that I was, I was, um, I would be affected this greatly. So when I went to Vietnam for the first time, and then look around, also just to walk around the streets and see everyone looks like you, it blew my mind, you know. And then you go to the bookstore, or just seeing the posters and billboards, there's all these Asian faces. You know, it was just, it was such a life changing moment. I went back to, I was actually in film school at the time. I went back to film school and completely changed the films I would watch, the films I would seek out, the books I would read. And, and the kind of stories I wanted to tell. And that took me on the trajectory that I'm still on today, which is basically tell more personal stories and stories that, um, uh, that you know, about things that really, were, that I felt like, you know, dealt with my own identity and my own, you know, my own journey as, a, as an artist and as a basically an Asian American artist. That's really incredible that like it's it's very personal for you. Um, and when I first heard your story, I was so inspired that like all in all your films, you had this drive to incorporate your Vietnamese identity into, which for me as a Vietnamese Chinese American was like super cool. Um, like I don't see a lot of films besides probably like the Ken Burns documentary that really like had a Vietnamese voice in it. Um, could you tell us a bit about how like in your films you've incorporated like actual Vietnamese cultures or Vietnamese voices or actors um, into your Yeah, films. so, so grew up in America, my only understanding of Vietnam in terms of, you know, you know, at least the way it was portrayed in the movies was through war. So, and growing up, all the main characters were, were always, you know, the soldiers, the white soldiers, American soldiers, and the only Vietnamese I ever, I ever saw on screen up to that point was basically people who are in the background, people who are actually, you know, kind of, you know, running back and forth in the jungles, but you were being shot at, that was it. You know, my only understanding of these people were basically background characters to be shot at, or if they were in the foreground, they were, you know, weren't even Vietnamese, they basically just picked any Asian they could find, pretended they were Vietnamese, and they gave them dialogue that wasn't even real dialogue, you know, real Vietnamese, they basically just gave them kind of like Asian gibberish, they would just say some things that were just passed as Vietnamese, you know? And mm -hmm. so I basically had a couple, couple, uh, you know, things that were important to me when I went off to make three seasons. I actually did Yellow Lotus first, which is a short film that I did, which is the precursor to the three seasons. And, it was, and all this stuff was based on my travels to Vietnam in the 90s and seeing economic changes and, and seeing the social changes and seeing, um, you know, what was going on. And um, so I wanted to take that portray and put it in the movie. But what was important to me was when I set up to make my, set up to make my film was, was a couple of things. First, for this, at least for this first one, I want to make sure that it didn't deal with war. At least not directly, because you know all the films I've seen about Vietnam at some point, you know, was always about war. And I was like, okay, this one that I'm going to make is not going to be about war, um, at least directly. So in other words, not make anyone running through the jungles, fighting, shooting at each other, and stuff like that. The second thing that was really important to me was making sure that 
the film would actually be shot on Vietnamese land. All the other films I've seen, you know, whether it's Apocalypse Now, Platoon, you know, Full Metal Jacket, all these other films, you know, always, you know, it was about Vietnam, but it was always shot in like Thailand or Cambodia or the Philippines, and it, and it, and it would pass through Vietnam. So it was important to me to actually shoot on, on the soil of Vietnam. The second thing was important to me to actually use Vietnamese people in the movie, you know, and and so, you know, that took a lot of work. That means I had to go out and find Vietnamese actors. And and uh, so it wasn't like just, oh, you know, any actor would, would, would could pass as Vietnamese. So I want to make sure there was real Vietnamese actors. And the, and the third thing that was really important to me was to actually have Vietnamese dialogue uh, and have real Vietnamese people speaking real Vietnamese and not just something that sounded like Vietnamese, but, but you know, but people thought, oh, that's good enough and just throw it in there. So so that was really important to me. And, uh, but that's tough, you know, being in America, how do you present, you know, these list of things you want to do and then get it financed out of America, you know. Um, but fortunately, I made a short film that did really well, that put me on the trajectory um, to get actually a, um, support through the Sundance Screenwriting and Filmmaking Labs, uh, which is a prestigious lab that helps uh, first time filmmakers and second time filmmakers in America. And, um, and uh, so that was really, really an amazing thing. And then that sort of then gave the project some credibility and that led to one thing to another and we were able to get the project financed and shoot in Vietnam. Mm, that's, that's amazing. So when you make these films, you have to reach out to many Vietnamese people and learn about the Vietnamese stories. Do you, like how extensive is the research project? Like, is it like a year of research, two weeks of research? Like, can you tell us a little bit about like the background? That goes yeah, into so films. every every project's different. Like like when I made three seasons, it was really just based on a lot of things that I saw, a lot of the changes I saw in Vietnam in the mid '90s, um, and the film reflected those changes. So I took a lot of the, what was going on economically, you know, socially in the country, and, and then put it into stories, you know, and then sort of sort of distill that into um, into stories and humanize it in a way that people can relate to and understand. And what was important to me was. Even though it was a film about Vietnam, Vietnamese people at that time in present day Vietnam, it was important to me that the storytelling, the characters and the emotions were still universal. So it wasn't like only Vietnamese people can watch it and understand it. I want to make sure that people who, you know, you know, in America or in Europe or in South America can watch it and still relate to it because it's still about things that are important to all of us. It's about acceptance. It's about, you know, um, identity, about trying to make it in the world. It's about you know, it's about love and it's about loss and grief and stuff like that. So the package in this film where when people watch it, they knew they were watching real new people and something authentic. And that was important um, to me. So, but in terms of the research, that film was, was took about, you know, it was written over a period of two years of just actually um, being on the streets of Saigon during that time period and seeing those changes. And, and, um, and actually just, um, you know, going around and, and interviewing a lot of people, meeting a lot of people. And um, uh, I remember, you know, my uncle had this motorbike, so he would always take me around or I would get my own motorbike and I would follow him. And we would just spend a lot of times just, you know, hanging out on the streets or just going to coffee shops or being, you know, outdoor cafes. And, and, and uh, it just met a lot of really interesting people. And that became the characters in the story. For this current film, um, which is, you know, about a really famous photo and about something that's really historical, but something that's actually been, you know, that because the photo is so well known, having won the Pulitzer Prize and all that, um, the research for this has been uh, extensive and 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 really purposeful. Whereas, let's say three seasons, it was you know, cause, you know, at that time I didn't know exactly the film I was going to make, so I was just about keeping a lot of diary notes, interviewing people, seeing people, and that became the film. This. You know, I kind of have an idea what the film is going to be, and I'm writing it right now. So the research is really to to um, to support the film, and and the research has you know is, is, has been quite extensive, interviewing people in America, interviewing people in Vietnam, flying you know all over the place, and um, and um, and uh, uh, you know I, I think for something like this, the research it has been incredibly important. I've been doing the research with my producing partner, Naja Lockwood, and we've been, uh, I think by the time, you know, we've done this research, I think in terms of the knowledge we've gained and the people we met as it pertains to this photo, I think, you know, I think I think we pretty much have met everyone who's still alive today who, who has was at that location or, 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 or participated in the area when the photo was taken, which is pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, 
And um, it's been a lot of hard work, but, but again, it's been really important for us to do something that's authentic and 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 when you when you're doing something with real lies to to put in the work to make something that feels real and um, that honors the people who live through this in a proper way. Yeah, that's that's incredible. That's awesome that you get to really talk to these people um, and hear their stories. When you interview them, I'm curious, like, do you notice any common themes or like common struggles or like, do you get any special emotions when you interview them? And what's that process like? Oh, my God, it's so emotional. I actually just uh, uh, did a weekend of interviews. Um, what's today? Tuesday. What's well, Tuesday in America, Tuesday evening. So on Saturday and Sunday, my producer and I, Naj and I, we did a series of um, interviews with a bunch of uh, veterans, for, Southern veterans, um, our veterans who were, and and so when the, for those who don't know the photo, the photo is a very famous photo of a napalm attack. Um, and it was a bomb that was dropped um, in the wrong place and it ended up, you know, um, uh, uh, landing on a group of villagers um, about 30 kilometers uh, northwest of Saigon in, in June 8, 1972. Which produces a very famous photo of a little girl running out of the out of the smoke and being burned in the napalm you see in the back. The the photo was the next day it was on the front cover of over 250 newspapers around the world. It became an iconic photo of the Vietnam War. The photo studied in in high schools all over America and around the world as well, and 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 it won the Pulitzer Prize and a bunch of other awards. Um, and many credit the photo as helping end the war or at least speed up the process of ending the war because it because it's just you know allowed people to see something that a lot of people did not see in the war um mm -hmm. so in terms of you know just the just the power of the photo and because it deals with a nine-year-old girl who was burned really badly and other people in the photo actually died and 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 um it the journey of doing this research has been incredibly emotional um you know, I was saying earlier this week, and we met a bunch of veterans. Um, you know, so you know, when when the photo was taken, what was going on was it was called the Eastern Offensive, which is the battle that was going on between North Vietnamese soldiers that had come down and fighting a lot of the South Vietnamese soldiers. Um, and this was happening to sort of, you know, get an advantage before the uh, Paris peace talks, which were coming at the end of the year. Anyway, so you know, when I was in Vietnam, we interviewed a bunch of um, uh, soldiers from the north, which is incredibly emotional, and um, and then this past weekend, I interviewed a bunch of uh, uh, veterans who were part of the uh, southern effort, the southern military. So, you know, it's fifty years, and 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 to get people's perspective, and so we get the military, you know, the the veterans, but also we interviewed journalists and 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 civilians who were there that day as well, and the ones who are still alive. Um, it's incredibly emotional because I think the impact of that day has stayed with all these people and um and um uh you know I, you know it's been 50 years so you know even if people don't get every single detail in memory correct that definitely the emotions and, and and what they felt are still there and to hear it from you know um from these different individuals you know has been an, an unexpected journey you know because i i came into it thinking oh i understand the photo and I understand what people are going to say about it. And it's actually been an eye-opening experience because everyone's memory and viewpoint of what happened that day has been very different and um, which has been really interesting. And, and then that the difference in the, in how people view that day, I was like, okay, that is the power of the story. And I'm starting to incorporate that into the screenplay as well. Wow. And, and Kim Fook, who is the girl who is running um, in that photo, for those of you who don't know, she's alive. And I think she, she lives in Canada now, you said. Um, yeah, she lives just outside of Toronto. So do you engage with her a lot when you when you work on this film? Yeah, for sure. So the first person we spoke to uh, was Nick Oot. And how that came about, to be honest, is that, you know, my producer and I, we were actually involved in another project. Um, uh, and uh, we met Nick because he had access, because being a AP journalist and photographer, he had access to some archival footage that we needed. Um, and um, and I just started listening to him telling, of course I knew he was the guy who took the photo, but you know, there's so much stuff online about the photo. I thought I knew everything about the photo already. He started telling me stories and I was like, oh my God, I actually don't know, you know much about the photo at all. And then that the story 
of the photo itself is not even the most interesting part of the story. It's actually what happened before, what happened after, what happened underneath it, around the photo. All those stories, you know, blew my mind, and um, and and that started me on this on this journey. And um, and then of course, you know, the next person we at that meeting, Nick was my producer, and I. We ended up meeting Kim Fook. We actually spent two weeks with her in Italy um, last summer. Uh, they had an audience with the Pope. Pope Francis wanted to meet them because last year, the summer of last year was the 50th anniversary of the photo. The summer of this year, 2023, will be the 50th anniversary of the photo winning the Pulitzer Prize. So there's a lot, been a lot of just momentum energy with people um, honoring the photo or rediscovering the photo and the importance of the photo um, and the importance of photo journalism. And um, especially with everything that's going on, you know, with Ukraine and, and, and a lot of the conflicts and wars, you know, wars still happening around, around the globe. The idea of bearing witness and the idea of the important work of photojournalism and that. But yeah, we met her with Kim Fook and um, incredibly emotional. You know, uh, spoke to her a few times on Zoom first, of course, and uh, then met her for the first time. We all went to Italy together, and um, and we, you know, uh, it's incredibly emotional. And to hear the events through her eyes um, is something that. You know, is in, you know something I definitely will never forget. Mm -hmm. Kim Fook's story is truly super inspirational, um, and I liked hearing about kind of like the momentum that you have in terms of like people like going back to the photo again and like going back to Vietnam War, um, like the history and the significance of it. So speaking on that momentum, can we like know when the film is expected to come out? Because I'm so excited to see it based on what you've told me. Uh, Do you have an expected date yet? Um, I mean we. You know, I just got back from Vietnam. I was doing the final phase of the research. Uh, and I'm actually in the middle of, you know, writing it right now and hopefully we finish the screenplay in the next couple of months. And then, you know, then we go out with it. Once the screenplay is done, the next step is then to go out and, and put together the rest of the financing. We have some financing for development right now, but, but we then need to get the full financing, uh, which then gives us a green light to go make the film. And then from there, we then have to go and, to the, go through the whole casting process, which is a which is a long process. There's a lot of steps still, you know. And then we have to decide whether we're going to shoot the film in Vietnam or somewhere else. Ideally, I like to shoot the film in Vietnam, but you know, we have to get uh, approval from Hanoi, the government, and and that takes a lot of steps. And and um, and the, the subject matter, you know, 50 years ago, is still a sensitive one. It still deals with war and all that. So ideally, you know, being Vietnamese. American, having been born in Vietnam, I like to shoot the film in Vietnam, but if not, we have to shoot somewhere else. So, there's, so we have to look at you know, find locations and all that. So, you know, if, if we're lucky, we'll get to shoot the film in the second half of this year. You know, that's just shooting the film. You have to go through post-production, all that. So the film, at best, won't even come out until 2024. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a long process. In fact, when you go to the theaters or you're on Netflix and watch any of those movies, those movies were actually made like sometimes two years prior, you know, and uh, it's, it's a long process to, you know, Go through all the steps but by the time you see it usually the director and the actors have moved on to something else because you know <laughs> the, you know you know it's just a that, because usually that stuff the film was shot long before but then you go through a long post-production process then marketing process distribution process it goes to the film festival you gotta wait for that so a lot of steps you know so we're still in the early stages but but you know that's why the support of, of, of um, let's say columbia has been you know it's been great because they the, you know, a lot of the access to some of the research materials and the interviews um, would have been far more difficult if it wasn't for um, Columbia and and uh, Professor Hong there, who's been really helpful in in um, in um, in with the research phase. And um, and also when I was in Saigon, we teamed up with Fulbright University and some of the professors there, and um, they've been really helpful in helping you with my research as well. That, that's incredible. So do you have like a the common theme? So after you work on this one film, will you work on another one? And do you think it's gonna be related to kind of like the Vietnam War and like Vietnam culture, like you said? Definitely. Um, you know, it wasn't, like I didn't go about it thinking I wanna do a film about the Vietnam War. So I usually think about it. In fact, if anything, I try to, maybe because I grew up watching so many Vietnam War films and and had this aversion to it almost because, you know, uh, I, in my mind, I was like, oh, there's so many other stories about 
Vietnam, Vietnamese people, and I don't want to always be about war, right? Like, I don't want, you know, mm -hmm. that's why my first few films that dealt with Vietnam, whether it was Three Seasons, Green Dragon, Yellow Lotus, and all that, were just about people. And I want to make sure it was, wasn't directly about war or anything. This, I guess it is in a way, because, you know, because, but, but the impetus for it was not to really tell a war story. Because it was just really, because the photo is so famous, it's just really to tell the story of what happened that day. And, and sure, it's about war, but to me, it's it's about so much more, and it's really about about um, uh, thematic is actually a film about truth and 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 how truth gets distorted and changed, and 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 how multiple multiple people could could experience a single event. You know, the event is so famous and well documented, and each of those experiences are different. Each of their truths are different. So it's about how you know, and it's about how you know. Anyway, so the, you know, thematically, it, it was something that was really interesting to me, and 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 um, and to explore as a, as an artist. But when you know, future stories, you know, it truly really whatever inspires me. I know that I want to keep on making films and telling stories about things that I care about, things that are personal to me. Um, but it doesn't have to be necessarily about the Vietnam War. It doesn't even, to be honest, necessarily have to be strictly about Asian Americans or Vietnamese Americans, um, because I did grow up in America, so I have stories I want to tell here too. But, but without a doubt, in one way or another, I will always make sure I put in, um, you know, an Asian actor or some Vietnamese character or storyline in there, just because my whole thinking is if if filmmakers like myself, if we don't do it, then who's going to do it, right? Like we got to put our own, you know, faces and our own stories, our own characters and on the screen and 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 I know how important that is because I didn't I did not grow up getting any of that myself. Like when I grew up, I didn't get to see, you know, those faces on the screen. So, you know, if I'm in the position now where I can change that, I definitely want to um help make that change. I, I love your whole message about, you know, Vietnam being more than just a war. And I, I love that because like this whole podcast that I created was you know, because I'm hearing like so many Americans, Vietnamese Americans who don't really know like what's going on in Vietnam outside of just the stories of the war. Like the community, like you said, is so strong here. The people are just so kind. Culture is so vibrant. Um, so that's really incredible. And I'm so personally inspired yeah. um, by all of this. And I love also hearing about your thoughts on like Asian American representation in the media. And you mentioned earlier about like everything everywhere all at once and about all of those awards. I'm wondering if, you know, maybe you could comment about that and perhaps like where you see Asian American representation going and where you think it's at right now. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I remember just not too long ago, like like five, six years ago, I was involved in, in directing this TV pilot. And I remember uh, there was like five main characters in an ensemble piece. And I and I remember talking to the to the uh, uh, to the executive of the studio and to the producers and all that. I just wanted to put in make sure one of the characters, just one, to be Asian American, and had a list of some Asian American actors. And you know, the note that I got back was that okay, let you know, let's you know, here's a list of actors, and there was like a long list, ten or twelve actors, and if all of them say no, then we we can start maybe considering some of these. You know, Asian American actors, and these are some of the top Asian American actors at the time, and it was just so frustrating because there's no way all ten or twelve of those actors would have said no. You know, the, you know, they all needed work and they all wanted to be in it, so someone's going to say yes. So, in other words, you know, it was their way of saying that it was, it was, you know, the chance of it happening of putting one Asian actor in there was slim to none. Even though it was an ensemble piece, we easily could have done so. You know, and that was just five, six years, six years ago. Cut to today, it's completely different. Uh, situation, different ball game. We have, you know, um, you know, so many projects now with, you know, Asian or Asian American filmmakers. We have Asian actors, Asian characters, and and um, uh, you know the, and I think this change is a long time coming, but it's finally here, and I think it's only going to get better. So so it's actually really um, a great time to be a filmmaker, a storyteller, um, you know. Uh, if you're a person of color, if you're Asian, uh, because the chance of getting your stories made and and being able to cast, whether it's Asian faces or Vietnamese faces, um, is much higher now than it's ever been before. So it's it's a really dynamic time for to tell you know our stories and um, and the wide range of stories you know is actually pretty inspiring. You know, uh, you know, take for example a film like you know. Um, everything everywhere all at once that didn't have to be 
Yeah, they didn't, that could have been, you know, any, it could be white, black, you know, Latino, any actors could have played those roles, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like, you know, a film that was set in a specific country and it had to be those people. And that's what makes, the, you know, that so exciting. You know, they decide, you know, to cast, you know, uh, some Asian characters in there as the lead roles. And and that is is uh, is a, something that I don't think could have happened even just a few years ago. Thank you. And, do you and by the any... way, there's a lot more projects, there's a lot more projects in development that are coming that are, you know, that are Asian stories or have Asian actors in them or or have Asian leads that were not written to be Asian specific, meaning they could have cast any, you know, um, uh, actor in those parts and they decided to cast whichever one they thought was the best and, and it just happens to be, you know, an Asian face or an Asian actor. So that's really exciting. That's when, you know, when real progress is happening, you know. That's so incredible. And that's so refreshing to hear knowing that like, you know, Asians or Asian Americans who want to enter that field um, will find some sense of comfort or at least more than before. Um, so I'm wondering, do you have any advice perhaps for like young Asians, Asians, Americans, Vietnamese who want to break into this world of like breaking all down all these barriers, whether it be the film industry specifically or just generally, because I know that you're very experienced. Do you have any advice that you would give? Yeah, I, I would say you know, especially when you're starting out to tell personal stories. Don't try to copy anyone else and try to like, you know, uh, emulate anyone else. You, know, you can be inspired by something, but but go out and try to tell your stories. I have to say, you know, I was um, asked to be on the jury of a short film festival in Saigon uh, in late December, early January. And, um, you know, and in watching those films and then in watching a group of short films um, of another organization before that, Wow, I mean, the next generation of filmmakers coming out of Saigon are actually pretty incredible. You know, these were filmmakers by 19 year olds, 20, 21, 22, and, um, and they were incredible shorts. I was actually, you know, pleasantly surprised. And what's remarkable, you know, um, about the shorts that I saw were two things. One was the diversity of stories. It wasn't like they were only telling one kind of story or just about, you know, you know, I mean, it, 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 it was, it was um, you know, it, some of it was stories about teenage life. Some of it was about college life. But some of it was just completely different. There was this, you know, a story of, uh, uh, about exploring sexuality, a story about, you know, I mean, it was just, it was just you know, about family, about, 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 genera you know, there was one short that was about generations and then, and, and, you know, it, and, and, and then there was a, a short that was a little bit more, you know, genre based that was, you know, that had to do, you know, had more horror elements. You know, they're, you know, like what's great about these students is they were taking chances. They were telling stories that, that were interesting to them and meant something to them. And um, and I was really, uh, you know, I, I had a great time being on the jury and I was really inspired by these students. Um, the, you know, and the other thing that I noticed, which was actually pretty remarkable, was the how many female directors there were you know and that's not always the case and i hear like you know that's something that 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 um you know there's a bit of a disparity of that in, in other countries especially other asian countries but at least here in vietnam you know we gave out i think three awards the two two of them were you know the two two of the awards were given to female directors and this other event i went to the same thing out of the three awards given two were female directors you know and the amount of female to male directors um were actually 50 50. so i mean that's pretty incredible that you know more of the youth here in Vietnam are deciding to go into the arts, to go into storytelling, go into filmmaking, but also, but it's not leaning to, you know, all being mostly men. But it, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it felt like there were there, it was it was, it was um, equal fifty fifty, and and that's really inspiring as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's you know, the only advice that I can give is just keep doing it, right? I mean, I think the kids today who are becoming who want to become filmmakers have something that's really special and that is you can stream so many movies and watch so many movies you know and so I'll write you know you know at your fingertips you know I definitely did not have that growing up trying to find movies was difficult you know when I was living in New York you know we had to go to these video stores and um and and it, sometimes it would take hours just searching through you know physically searching through trying to find you know the movies we wanted to see or films from Asia or films from Europe films from Latin America today you can just you know basically go online and find it and then have it create your computer or your, or your TV, which is pretty amazing. So, you know, and then, you know, when I was growing up to make a film, 
you know, you had to go out and check out really expensive equipment. You had to shoot on celluloid. Today, you know, with your iPhone, you can you can shoot a film with a higher quality than than some of the more expensive cameras I had back in the day. So so, you know, there's really nothing that should stop any of these young kids today making films because you can you know, the access is incredible. So really, just go out and doing it and 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 not being afraid to fail. All right. Thank you for that advice. Yeah, I think it's so important to like you know, tell your story. Like you said, authenticity is super important. And it's so exciting to hear from you that there are so many opportunities out there for Asians and for Asian Americans as well. Yeah. Um, and I know we've got to go. I want to say, yeah, I want to say one more thing real quick. Okay. You know, so if you're young and, and you want to be a filmmaker, or storyteller, this is the time to experiment and do whatever it is that you really want to do, because I'm telling you, it gets harder as you get onto the industry, because you don't always get to do what you want. Because now it's about money and the budgets get bigger and you have to answer to other people and studios and executives, especially when you're spending a lot, you know, a lot of money that, you know, that belongs to other people. There's going to be a lot more demands and, and a lot more people who give their opinions what you should or should not make. But when you start out and you're making, you know, your short films or 10, 15, 20 minutes, you know, that's when you should absolutely make your films. And because this, you know, because it actually gets tougher along the way. And, 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 and if you could hold on to that desire to keep on telling your stories and more powerful, you know, more power to you. And that's what you should be doing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tony. Thank you. It was, it was uh, great to be here and uh, great to talk to you. Best of luck in your film career. Thank you so much.